Why are you gay? Think about it. Have you ever thought about that? Why are you gay? That is the question of the day. But anyway, what's going on? Well, fact, my name is Denaric Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnia Reacts to Geography Now Uganda this time. Okay, before we get into it, I have a big announcement to make. Uh, remember that book I said that I would write long ago? Well, it's finally done, and it's out on the Amazon store for Kindle and uh, hardcover. So if anybody's uh, interested in reading and wants to read something that I wrote and edited, I did everything by myself, basically, except for the book cover that was done by um, a freelancer I hired. But the book is named The Hangman's Plague. It should be in the description below. Or you can go to my uh, channel about page and it should be there as well. So, um, yeah, those who are asking, uh, you needn't ask anymore. The book is complete. It's quite the read. So uh, the hard book cover, I, I did a hard book. I didn't do a paperback. Uh, the hard cover has around 350 pages, I believe. So it's quite the read. If you're into reading a lot, uh, then go ahead, pay, pick up the book and... Uh, Tell me what you think about it. Now, I'm kind of nervous after saying all that. <laughs> and it's the, I literally wrote a book. You People aren't aware. I'm, not to like toot my horn, but people are not aware just how much work goes into writing a book. And it's finally something that I... It was something that I've wanted to do ever since. I don't know. It's just a, a personal thing of mine. But anyway, back to the video. Uganda. I'm going to try to restrain myself from doing you do you know the way okay now that i got it all out let's just put it behind us it's not even a meme created in uganda unlike the why are you gay thing which was from uganda by the way so this country oh my god when they like started to fight in the parliament with the wwe commentators in the background like this, this country is funny <laughs> i'll be honest um i don't know if uh, the ugandans are aware of just like how popular the country is thanks to memes but it is what it is. So anyway, I want to like get actually into the video now. Uh, geography now, Uganda. All right, it is end game. We are now in the U countries, getting closer to the end of the alphabet. This episode, Uganda, known as the Pearl of Africa, despite having virtually no pearling industry. Along with uh, the Pearl of Africa, it's called the Pearl of Africa, not because of its pearl industry, but um, basically Winston Churchill, I'm pretty sure. A lot of you have heard of him when he was doing a tour of Africa of the British colonies. He was going like from Cape Town all the way upwards to like Egypt or something. And when he passed by Uganda and when he left Uganda, for him, it was like such a beautiful place. And I'll be honest, Uganda has like some beautiful scenery without a doubt. He then named it the Pearl of Africa. So it was Winston Churchill. With Tanzania and Kenya, Uganda is the last member of the Swahili powerhouse triplets. Well, they speak uh, English. Don't you need quadruplets? Yeah, it's more like your third de facto language. Plus, you guys have that weird thing with Belgium, and you guys only have like 13 million people. Yeah, but we have a consistently rising GDP index with an emerging startup industry surpassing all other powerhouses. Okay, fine. Swahili quadruplets. Jeez, whatever. Let's move on. Uganda is a complex nation riddled with everything from crowns on the constituent monarchs to the crowns on the crowned cranes. Uganda be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, I had to. It's time you going to do this to me? <laughs> hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Get your Geography Now merch like this cool mug at geographynow.com. Oh, uh, I'm selling out if it's your I'm brand. Want also uh, see so this really cool Uganda shirt that I'm wearing? Yeah, it was made In by Geography Ruba, remember her from the Sudan episode? She uh, makes Ruba. these shirts and if Should you are interested it. in getting an <laughs> Africa logo shirt, go to unityshirtshop.com, support her business. Well, to support her business, I would suggest her to, like, just make flags of all the countries in the world. Why does it have to be, you know, specifically Africa? I'd get myself a Bosnia shirt. Why not? Thank you, Ruba. And check out the Sudan episode. She was good in it with her cousin, Mathani. I love diving into East Africa because the whole region is like this geothermally active yet super lush rift valley that the Bantus and the Nilotes migrated to. And as you guys know, I love having people either from the country or people that have heritage from the country. And with that, say hi to our Ugandans, Paihan and big. Kimmy. What's poppin', man? What's How you guys up? doing? What's you guys, you guys ready up? for Uganda? Let's, the bio. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> 
So Uganda is a complicated place when it comes to the map because this legally demarcated structure of Uganda is based on colonial lines versus the traditional regions. We'll explain a little more, but first let's jump into Uganda the map with the motion like... graphic, shall we? Let's do it. You first of all, so. Uganda is a landlocked country located in East Africa straddling the equator bordered by five other countries. Uganda also lays claim to the largest portion of Lake Victoria, cut close at the one degree parallel, and slicing through random island boundaries with Kenya, even though half of these islands are disputed like Mikingo, Ringiti, Ramba, and even Sigulu Island had a few complications even though it is under Ugandan authority. In fact, they have two other disputes, one with South Sudan over the Logoba slash Moyo districts, where the border was never formally demarcated during colonial times, so they just kind of went at it. And with the DRC, you have this little guy over here in Lake Albert, Rukwanzi Island, which had a skirmish in 2007, and since then has been occupied full-time by Congolese soldiers. The country is divided into four regions, with the capital and largest city of the country being Kampala, on the coast of Lake Victoria. Here you can also find Port Bell, the largest port, which is only a small pier where most lake-bound shipping containers are dropped off and transferred to a rail line connecting to it. Due to the layout of the city, Kampala doesn't host any airports within its metropolitan vicinity, and all travelers wishing to visit must fly to Entebbe International, which lies about 25 miles or 40 kilometers south of Kampala. This is the only international airport within the country, however, altogether there are 47 domestic regional cool airports and airstrips, the second and third busiest being Ora and Gulu airports in the north. Gulu actually being the third largest city of the country, the second being Mbabara in the south. All of Uganda is interconnected via paved and unpaved road networks, and they are part of the Trans-African Highway Line 8 that essentially connects West Africa from Lagos, Nigeria, all the way to Mombasa, Kenya. Uganda also has some rail lines, however, today the only one in operation is the Malaba-Kampala line. Fun side note, Kampala is one of the fastest growing cities on earth and it produces about half the country's GDP. Also, it was ranked by global development agencies as East Africa's most comfortable city. Yes. I've also heard some people say it's a quite a chaotic city now. Chaotic in many different senses. Uh, what, did you know, by the way, this is true, um, Uganda is one of the most entrepreneurial countries in the world. Now, that being said, a lot of the companies that people open up start in Uganda don't don't um make it let's just say uh it is known that nine out of ten companies fail so um but if one of them at least succeeds that's uh, pretty significant for the for the country as a whole so i guess that's some good news coming from uganda now people if those who want to visit i heard this is a place that's one of the nicest places to visit nicest places to visit in all of africa and, and even for foreigners to live despite the fact that you stand out quite a bit like me or Paul would, uh, but uh, the locals there, if you're like very respectful to them, if you if you enjoy their customs, their values, all that, uh, then they'll basically see you as one of their own. From what I heard, despite the fact that some may see from what I from what I heard, like they may see people that you know look like me, they automatically think American, and uh, you know America is not the most popular country in the world, unfortunately, but um. So people might yell at you, hey, you American, get out of here, or whatever, and, and their uh, English is very good. By the way, their English is one of the best in all of Africa, as a matter of fact, 87% of them speak English, and with a very clear accent as well, so you, um, they don't speak like some sort of weird Creole sounding language like, I don't know, Jamaicans would, but you can understand them nice and clearly, so... Uh, from and uh, a lot of times they would take matters into their own hand if there's like a criminal out in the city, they would actually like... I heard one one time they stripped a criminal naked and they beat him up and sent them out into the city just to walk home, I guess. So if they see you as one of their, your own, if you respect their values and all that, they would actually protect you and see you as a part of uh, part of their extended family, let's just say. So one person who actually who dropped their phone and some somebody from Uganda was going up to snatch it, uh, an older lady just grabbed onto him and like scolded him vehemently that uh, you shouldn't do that to foreigners or whatever but um yeah unfortunately a lot of a lot of parts of africa don't get a good rep when it comes to um you know, lo foreigners visiting especially in the more or, or rural areas but i guess uh, uganda is a bit of a outlier there even ahead of kigali so uh we're gonna like keep doing this now you're just gonna keep throwing me into the ring hey i'm just saying you guys set high standards you're like the singapore of africa yeah 
And don't you forget it. Now, administratively, Uganda is composed of four regions. Most people in Uganda don't really even see it that way. If you really want to understand Uganda, you have to look at the traditional ruling map. Although, yes, the country is a unitary presidential republic, we'll talk more about this later, nonetheless, Uganda has Was one of the largest number of edge. recognized constituent traditional monarchies and paramount chiefdoms in the world. Now, it's hard to get an exact number because some of the people groups have unclear succession practices with multiple claimants to the throne. So it's like kind of in limbo. But for the record, monarchy in Uganda goes way back, thousands of years. It is speculated that the earliest mass dominion of rule was the Kitara Empire that existed from the early Bronze Age Very to about long. 500 AD. It was ruled by these mysterious, how do you say it? Chwezi. Chwezi. Chwezi kings that only have oral tradition about them passed down. Chwezi. 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 Depending on how you classify or legitimize them, today there are about 30 main prominent regional kingdoms and chieftains. Generally speaking though, the five largest ones that claim territory that makes up about half of the entire country's land mass are the Bantu-based kingdoms of Busoga, Bunyoro, Toro, Ankole, and the largest one, the Baganda, which is subsequently where Uganda got its name from. And you are Buganda, or Luga Luganda, no, Buganda, right, that's the word the people. Baganda. Baganda. Baganda, Baganda yeah. is the people. You guys have all these prefixes to your words, I swear. <laughs> Bantu languages, man. <laughs> Even Baganda, some people so hard. And from there, in the north, you find the Nilotic chieftains, mostly the Acholi and the Karamoja. If we're going to be super... Okay, for those who don't know, uh, the Bantus are kind of like a people group of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that migrated from what we today know as Nigeria. So they went and uh, kind of like what the Indo-Europeans did in Europe and in India, the Bantus kind of did with... Africa and the Nilotics are like uh, from around like central or eastern Africa around that region as well so uh yeah something like you think of the Indo-European and the Uralic peoples something like that happened in Africa as well so um yeah now regarding uh, Uganda and its history like like they already mentioned a lot of it is oral tradition of how these kings used to rule their kingdoms and whatnot but um uh, when when the Europeans came in around the 19th century, turn of the 19th century, I believe, uh, the Europeans came in, they, you guessed it, came in to colonize, to cover the place, uh, ruled the areas, not as, not as uh, directly as, say, like South Africa, but, uh, you know, they had their own uh, rule over the area. The British were the ones who took over. Uh, today's Uganda, or back in the day, it was like Buganda and a bunch of different kingdoms that they put together in one st administrative division. Then, as we all know, the British uh, British rule in Africa started to wane over time, and Uganda declared itself in independent, uh, I believe. Let me try to get the exact date. Somewhere around October, let's say 8th of October, 1962, maybe I give or take a few days. Then they gained full independence, then a, some sort of monarch took over. Uh, then we would have the military rule of probably the most infamous person from Uganda of all time, Idi Amin. I'm pretty sure a lot of us have heard of him. His rule was indeed very brutal, even though he ruled only for eight years. Now, Idi Amin, uh, he is a Bugandan. Okay, he's from the largest people group of Uganda, and uh, he, let's just say he didn't view the other people groups. Uh, very positively. He was kind of like a Milosevic of Uganda, in a sense. Uh, so he was very nationalist, and he was very brutal. He killed upwards of 500,000 people during his rule, which, you know, Uganda at the time didn't have that many people. He came to rule starting in the 19, 1971 to 1979, I believe. He's, yes, that's it, eight years his rule lasted, but he killed 500,000 people in that time, which... At the time, was a lot of people in, uh, in uh, Uganda. They say he fed so many people to the crocodiles, just because reasons, uh, that the, that a hydroelectric power plant was uh, clogged up from the bodies of like those people that you know, the alligators would rip apart or whatever. So, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty brutal, I would say. Uh, but after, afterwards, he was uh, deposed because he decided to throw a war against Tanzania for some reason. Later on, he found out his army is good at bullying people, not really good at fighting uh, other armies. And the Tanzanian army uh, was victorious, uh, along with some uh, Ugandan, Ugandan peop uh, exiles. Yeah, some people were exiled from Uganda to Tanzania. They fought back successfully. They made it to Kampala, the capital of Uganda. 
and Idi Amin fled to Saudi Arabia, where he died, basically. At one point, he wanted to uh, start a war against Israel. Long story. Also, interesting story. They one of the most uh, prominent suggestions for creating a Jewish state. We all know Israel today is is that Jewish state, but they were actually suggesting Uganda to be like a homeland for the Jews. But at the end of the day, nothing like that uh, ended up happening, and they went to Israel instead. So um, yeah. And after he was deposed, another monarch came into power. I keep forgetting his name, Miss Sala or something. <laughs> I, I know Idi Amin, okay. So, and then uh, maybe I'll put him up on screen, the guy. Uh, you might recognize him as well, but he, he basically ruled the country all the way up until like 2005. So, so because a lot of Ugandans are under 18, that's the only person they ever knew that, that, that came to came to power that that held power ever since they were born. So uh, yeah, recently there was like a whole, a lot of chaos going on. It was only like two years ago where there was a lot of chaos going on, a potential civil war to erupt. Like the military started cracking down because the people weren't so happy that like the same guy was ruling uh, the whole time. And um, here we are today. Yeah, it's Uganda, <laughs> uh, a place of many people groups. It is actually kind of doing well for itself as as of late. Well, has a long way to go, but um, it it's uh, definitely on the right path, and it's a very nice place for tourists. I heard so. And after checking out like Google Maps and like Lake Victoria, I have to say that is a one of my one of my most one of my favorite countries when it comes to geography in Africa. So technical though, there are actually six more traditional regions, including the West Nile ruled by the Sudanic chiefs Lango, Teso, Busugu, Bukedi, and in the far south Kigezi, making a total of fifteen traditional main ruling areas. Mm -hmm. And see now, during the British colonial times, these uh, kingdoms and chiefdoms were actually made into functional subdivisions of Uganda prior to the four region system. From you guys' understanding, what is like the role of monarchy in Uganda. It's kind of like for show at this moment yeah. because they have no official oh, power. I would say it's it's good for the people's oh, for morale, sure. <laughs> but outside of that, and that's the part that's like heartbreaking. There is a distinct level of influence though, right? Yeah, I would say like if you see a prince or a king, they're treated as royalty, respected, and they hold a certain cal cultural value. Are they going to send me like emails? Right. They're, they're very structured they'll too. Make me like a they have their own parliament and everything. Like the Nigerian yeah, like budget. But, and you feel that is important though to have and maintain. Absolutely. Very. Which yeah, I wouldn't mind. Self-esteem of people legit. is very important. But you, you're you uh, descended from a... <laughs> oh, man. You guys made me feel special. Yeah, my grandmother, she was actually um, Mutesa's uh, older sister. Yeah, so I have, like, royal blood, I guess some people would say. My, uh, my... Auntie Princess Buganda. I'm like, for the... <laughs> well, another the thing that withstands the time in Uganda are there famous places of notable interest that you should check out if you go to Uganda. Here is one of our geography peeps to explain. Hi, everyone. My name is... Rose Basemira, Uganda has so many cool places to see once you visit. Here are some of the top destinations I think you should check out. Firstly, we straddle the equator. You can see this in the it's town of Kayawe, just southwest of Kampala. There's even a restaurant that goes through it. We also have the amazing Kasubi tombs, which are actually a UNESCO heritage site. Bethel Church, the world's smallest church that can fit only three people. We have the neural rock paintings, the Ngongo Culture Center, Sese Islands, which have amazing beaches. We also have I've Ginger, seen which is the adrenaline capital maps. of East Africa, y'all. If you love to party, definitely try out the nightlife. Ugandans know how to party. Ugandans know how to have fun. Wee wee! Thank you very much, and I hope you get to enjoy Uganda if you're ever lucky enough to visit. Thank you! Very quickly, uh, favorite memories and places of Uganda that you have. Go. Ooh, man! Okay, so my favorite memory, going to people's houses at 6 p.m., which was kind of a tea time. And another thing was the mall, Garden City, which opened in the early 2000s. Also, swimming at the Sheraton in Kampala. I, I, my older cousins, they wanted nice. to take us somewhere. We were visiting from Kenya. So it's like, hey, my out of town cousins are here. I want to kind of show them around, right? We were running down this like dirt hill, right? We were in this like big, big crib. And then there was this 
15 to 20 people sitting on like fold out chairs and they're watching something and I'm like, what's going on, right? So I look and I see a sheet um, that's like stuck to the roof and they got this sheet down and there's a projector playing a movie. So we're watching this and it was like a Billy Blanks movie. <laughs> yeah, no, the, guy, the, guy, the guy from Tybo, the <laughs> yeah. Tybo guy, it was a Billy. A makeshift theater. Yeah, like a so makeshift theater, yeah, exactly. That's legit, you just unlocked the memory. Is, is the <laughs> see, theater. that's like, you, you remember, right? It's, yeah. And sometimes they would dub them them in Luganda. <laughs> I think this yes. one was dubbed too. I exactly. think this one was dubbed. So yeah, as you can see, so many layers to Uganda. It just gets crazier and crazier the more you peel kingdoms, monarchies, chiefdoms. It's a lot. With that, we move on to the next segment. The... So Uganda is situated in a very unique spot in the core of Africa. It may not have a coastline, but definitely has a lot of water. And not just any water, but some of the most important water in all of Africa. First, let's jump into the motion graph and explain, shall we? First of all, Uganda is situated right in the middle of two fault line branches of the East African That's Rift interesting System. Geography. To the west, a line runs along the border with the DRC, and the eastern fault line lies just a few hundred kilometers past their border with Kenya. These rift systems, in a sense, elevate Uganda's overall topography, meaning that even though much of their lush green central valleys are mildly hilly or flat, it still has an average elevation around 3,200 feet or 1,100 meters above sea level. And well, looking at this, its geography definitely is full of natural defenses, obviously, like Victoria here, but also another, other lakes here, uh, jungles here, some deserts over here, and lots of these interesting looking, I'm going to guess uh, hydroelectric power plants created uh, all these, so it's naturally well defended from the looks of it, so, um, Kem and Kampala is just in a very interesting spot, I don't know, I just find it, it's a uh, geography very um, interesting. It's also um, one of the oldest inhabited places in, in the world, basically, after all, it's right next to Ethiopia, and and uh, one of the, some of the oldest uh, human uh, fossils that we found ever were uh, from this part of Africa. So one other thing that's interesting about Uganda is that uh, from, according to most sources, this is where the Nile starts. This is where the Nile begins. Now, right around, I can't see, but if that's Kampala, right around here, I think it should be something known as the Victorian Nile. And from a lot of sources, this is the where, where the Nile begins. Now, some other sources claim that, you know, uh, some river around here like that flows into Lake Victoria is the real source of the Nile. But eh, let's just say the Victor Victoria, Lake Victoria is is the uh, source for the Nile. Uh, now, people back in the days, I think Europeans specifically, thought that because they didn't know the exact source of the Nile and they didn't have much of Africa mapped out. They didn't know much about some Central Africa at, at the time, Europeans before this, the Age of Discovery. So there were only myths and legends about where the um, uh, source of the Nile begins. And a lot of people thought in Central Africa there would be like a massive Alp, Alps style, you know, mountain range where, where from the mountain flows the waters into Egypt, out into the Mediterranean. Well, it turns out it's actually just from... Uganda, so. And slopes northward into Sudan's plains. Each of these rift systems also gives Uganda two distinct volcanic ranges on their respective sides. On the east, the range starts with Mount Elgon, shared with Kenya, going up to the northernmost tip of Uganda. And on the west, you have the small 75 mile long, 125 kilometer long Rwenzori Range. Although short in length, the Rwenzori Mountains are the tallest mountain range in Africa. They are also the highest non volcanic and non orogenic mountains, that is, a mountain range formed without being directly on the convergence of a major tectonic plate. Here you can find the tallest peak shared with the DRC, Mount Stanley, or more specifically, so Margarita Peak, standing at over 5,100 meters tall. I'll enjoy a Margarita. Feet. It is the third tallest peak in Africa oh, and is high enough to support glaciers and perpetually snow-capped mountain peaks. We already mentioned the largest body of water, Lake Victoria, which is the source of the Nile, but it gets a little more complicated. See, Lake Victoria, being an elevated lake mm. at over a mile above sea level, is drained by the Victoria Nile that empties into Lake Kyoga first, the largest inland non shared lake of Uganda. It charges up a bit, then continues to flow and empty into Lake Albert, and then it transforms into the White Nile and then continues all the way to Egypt. And you know the rest of the story. Also, keep in mind, don't Nile. swim anywhere you want in Lake Victoria. No, and that's, that's very true. And apart from the deadly hippos and the crocodiles, there is also a risk of contracting schistostomiasis. What is that you say? Schistostomiasis is a parasitic fluke worm that burrows itself into your body and lays eggs and dies. 
your body reacts to said eggs with extreme inflammation until you naturally excrete them through either stool or urine passing. Yeah, so uh, don't get worms. Granted, over the years... Yeah, so Africa being, you know, specifically Uganda being on the equator, which would mean it's constantly warm. Now, in other colder places, temperate places, the winter would act... Uh, sort of like a purifier, let's just say, for all these parasites and bacteria because it's, it would be way too cold for them to survive. Uh, which is why you wouldn't hear such, you know, tales of crocodiles and of parasites in European lakes simply because Europe is way too cold for such things to survive. Not many <laughs> things survive in such cold environments, but most animals in the world, like, love environments more like, uh, Africa, which is why Africa has a lot of amazing and interesting wildlife, but at the same time, lots of parasites, mosquitoes, diseases, that sort of thing. So, there's the extreme growth in population has put a toil on the land, but nonetheless, the land is still rich in agriculture, such as coffee and even bananas. Speaking of coffee, I usually take Send an espresso coffee. break, but Noah's not here, he can't do a segment, so we'll just finish off. Who better than Ugandans to talk about Uganda? So, Uganda has seen a pretty noticeable economic boost in the past few decades, with an average GDP growth rate consistently hovering over the five to six percentile range. They are labeled as one of the most entrepreneurial countries, not only in Africa, but the world. For one, yes, of course they have quite a number of mineral resources such as copper, cobalt, limestone, and so on. And uh, also in September of 2022, about 14 metric tons of gold deposits were discovered in Uganda. It's a rich land, you heard? Speaking of which, Uganda is one of the few countries in Africa that actually has their own domestic car brand, the Kira. The state-owned and operated enterprise was founded in 2014 and has since developed Africa's first hybrid and the Kayula the first solar electric bus. Hydropower provides about 85% of the total electric energy capacity of a country. Granted, due to Sweet. the ever-growing population pollution. and demand for energy, load shedding or blackouts can happen sporadically, so just be mindful in case if you visit. When load shedding would happen, there is a little device Try called solar. a sigiri, which is like a mini stove made out of iron that mm. is rolled around. We put coal like into it, and it's yes. sort of a makeshift <laughs> cooker. Memory unlocked. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. Exactly. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Memory unlocked. That I remember that. Oh, stuff is coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you need it to be dark outside to see some of those nocturnal creatures that Ooh. Uganda is flourishing in. With that, it's time to bring out our Gary Hollow. Gary Hollow here with a sewer rat. So to summarize, Uganda is right. super unique because it's basically where the savannah meets the jungle. This landscape is super rich in flora and oh, fauna, yeah, they often allow you to see the top gorillas. 10 most biodiverse nations in the world. Look at all those Lobelia talaki plants. Kind of sus. <laughs> Here you can find 10 national parks and 13 wildlife reserves and sanctuaries, the largest being Murchison Falls National Park. They have nearly 350 mammal species, of course, including the Big Five. However, Uganda is more widely known for being a bird haven. With over a thousand species documented, it's estimated that about 11% of the world's birds can be found here, including the national animal which you can also find on the flag, the Grey Crown Crane, or the Gold and crested crane. Distinguished by the stiff golden feathers atop its head that resemble a golden crown or a very spiky afro, <laughs> it's majestic. <laughs> this hat here is my crown. By the way, nice new haircut, Gary. How Ooh, do you feel? I feel lighter. Not only did I get a haircut, I showered for the first time in months. Lake Bunyanyi, with its 29 Good islands, is known as the most popular place people go to in hopes of seeing the crane and other birds. Otherwise, Uganda is one of the only three nations that offer tours to see mountain gorillas. The windy, impenetrable forest has about half of the world's critically endangered primates, and the people wishing to see them are required to get a permit. The number of tourists is tightly controlled as to avoid disturbance. You do not want to disturb a gorilla. Yeah, they'll mess you up. <laughs> so those are some of the top wildlife facts on Uganda. Now Except I'm about to tame the wildest creature on the planet, my daughter. 
gotta love that great crown crane. Now, another thing you can't compare it to is a luscious, hearty cuisine. They know how to handle their way around the kitchen, and that's for real. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's discuss the food of Uganda. And who better to do it than another one of you guys, the Ugandan They have Japanese. Rolexes. Go! <laughs> Everyone, I'm back again, and I'm here to tell you about the food of Uganda. Firstly, within Uganda, each tribe is distinguished by their staple dishes. For example, the Acholi and Langi people have lots of dishes with millet and peanut butter. In the West, they use a shawe, which is like a mayonnaise-like sauce. The Wasoga people specialize in cassava, and the Wagishu people like to smoke bamboo shoots, which we locally call malewa. The Baganda specialize in Nwombo, which is like an African Somali. But one thing is for sure, we are the Matoke Republic. Why? We love cooking with Matoke. We have plenty of the Matoke plantains. and can put plantains. in almost any plantains. dish. Boiled, fried, stewed, mashed, whatever. We can do it. On the streets, you might find a very popular snack. Fried grasshoppers, fried white ants. Children yeah. do love this. And finally, you they can just rip the Uganda wings without off of getting grasshoppers and them. Legs. And no, I'm not talking about the expensive watch. To us, a Rolex is a chapati with eggs and anything from rolled veggies, a minced meat, sausages rolled up together, or roll eggs, hence Rolex, Rolex, you get the gist. It's a very popular street food. Everyone loves it. No one does it. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, there's even like a annual competition of who can make the best Rolexes in all of Uganda every year in I hope you get a chance Uganda. to come to Uganda and enjoy our wonderful cuisine. Bye. Thank you. Speaking of food, favorite Ugandan food, go. We would have matoke, and then obviously we would have some greens to eat with it, right? Ugali posho with beans is really good. Love the Rolex wraps. Those mm. are actually really, really good. So as you can see, the natural side of Uganda has so many layers to peel. The only thing more complex than it would be the people of Uganda. With that, let's move on to the next segment. The... Here's where it gets... All right, guys, uh, very Africa. quickly, uh, which ethnic group or tribe or people group are you from in Uganda? Well, I am half Banyankole and half Bifumbira. Well, as for me, Kenya, um, you, uh, Congo, and then in Uganda, my tribe is the Baganda people. How would Uganda stick out from the rest of East Africa or Africa in general? Mm -hmm. I would say compared to Tanzania and Kenya, we really do not speak Swahili like that. <laughs> like we speak English and then we break it down into different tribal languages. You know, my diverse background, I'm able to compare it and contrast. In Uganda, if you say something with a different tone, you could be changing the entire meaning of your sentence or mm. your entire meaning of the word. The one thing that like unites the all these languages is the cadence. That's Like the intonation, the yeah, tone. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm so scared of some of the words I'm pronouncing. I don't know if I'm <laughs> pronouncing them right. My mom would kill me. She'd be like, no, that's not how you say it. You're doing great. You You're say it. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Cool, cool. And with that, uh, let's just break it down statistic-wise in the motion graphic. Here we go. So population-wise, Uganda is made up of about 47 million people and is one of the fastest growing countries on Earth. They added 13 million to their population in only 10 years. Also keep in mind about 1.5 million of these people are refugees from neighboring countries, about 85% from the DRC and South Sudan. The country is made up of about 56 tribes and ethnic groups, however Bantu groups make up the largest demographic. In fact, the four largest tribes are Bantu and make up almost half of the entire population. They are the Baganda at about 17%, the Banyankole at about about 10%, the Basoga at about 9%, and the Bakifa at about 7%. From there, the fifth largest group, the Iteso, are an Nilotic group and make up about 7%. From there, the remainder of the country is made up of other various Bantu, Nilotic, Hamitic, and Sudanic groups. Some are multi-ethnic Ugandans and a small community of Asians, mostly Indo-Ugandans, that are mostly descended from Gujarati Indians from India. Yeah, there's so a lot of Indians So we use the as well. Ugandan shilling as our currency. However, keep in mind, we also do not Idi mind Amin. using euros well, expelled, or dollars but... as as well. Uganda uses the type G plug outlet and they drive on the left side of the road, you know, former British uh, colony, so left side. Now, language wise, English and as of 2022, Kiswahili are the official languages. How do you guys feel about that? So, uh, I think it's very, very important and I think it's a beautiful thing that they have done that because yes. that's going to be one of the vehicles that the African people use. We have our diversified languages and I think that's beautiful, but in addition to that, um, to make our connection a lot stronger, we need to have one unified language. 
even though not all the regions are natively Kiswahili, right. it's still kind of a unifying thing that brings right. them together and you, you support the Kiswahili right. movement. I mean, right? that's exactly. how. However, keep in mind, there are about 70 other languages spoken throughout Uganda. 41 are indigenous and they are divided into four main groups. Keep in mind, though, that the Luganda language of the Baganda people is the most widely spoken language in the country. Religion. Today, about 85% of the country adheres to some form of Christianity, a split between Catholics and Anglicans. I was actually Anglican and growing up, mm. whereas the largest Was? minority religion being Islam is somewhere around 14 percent. All right, now let's bring up the topic of other groups. For one, Uganda is usually ranked in the top five refugee hosting countries on earth and is the largest refugee host in Africa. Another community that has been notable in Uganda are the Indo-Ugandans or Ugandans of Indian descent, mostly the Gujaratis of West India. In colonial times of the 19th and early 20th centuries, about 32,000 Indian laborers were brought in by the British to work on the Ugandan servitude. railway. And when it was completed, most went back to Slaves. India, but about 7,000 decided to stay. The Indian community was kind of like the buffer between the British and the native Ugandan population. And and they usually had it better in terms of education and positions of employment and management. Mm -hmm. Now, after independence, there was a great period when President Idi Amin decided to expel most of the foreigners, primarily Indians, from Uganda. Without going too far into it, it basically kind of went like this. These Indo-Ugandans only make up about 1% of the population, yet they earn about a fifth of the national income. So... You should know, hear about the Chinese What's the plan? in Southeast Asia, I'm going Asia, to expel then. as many of them as I can, confiscate about 6,000 of their homes, businesses, firms, architectural estates, and so forth, as a way to give back the economy of Uganda to Ugandans. I mean, sounds good, right? How can Ugandans be against reclaiming their own country? Yeah, I have a feeling this is probably going to end up uh, pretty differently than the way you envision it will. Yeah, before independence, Sidi Amin served... Uh like in a branch of the British Army for Uganda, of course, and uh, he was actually well respected as a good leader, as a ruthless leader, but very, you know, like, a uh, good leader in military terms. And uh, he was actually quite intimidating for a lot of people. Many people said because he was also tall and very, you know, wide, that he was also like, it was like standing next to a bull from what they said. And you can tell from the look on his face that he just does not care. He'll throw you to the alligators and he'll go have lunch for all he cares. <laughs> and uh, there are like some videos out, out, out there about him where he's like, no one has a big, as, as big as a brain as I do or whatever he was saying. But um, yeah, go, go look him up. He's probably, uh, not probably, is the most infamous person in Ugandan history. And it did. I know this is kind of a heavy topic, but what do you guys think in regards to the whole complicated social dynamics between Indians and Africans and this whole thing that happened with Idi Amin? Oh man, I got a lot to say. You can go first. Um, I will start with kind of a personal anecdote. There is a bishop of my grandparents, Festo Kivenjere, he wrote a book, I Love Idi Amin, which is actually a book about forgiveness. Um, he was one of the religious clergy that were persecuted under Amin rule. Um, a lot of the people were unfortunately executed in stadiums in our village, um, in Kabale. But prior to him going off track, there are some things that sort of set the tone for his coming into power. So with me, it's it's a, it's a little bit different. You know, with me personally, I know with the Baganda people, Tessa was exiled. So he was actually in England and then he had died overseas. And uh, Obote at the time was like, no, I'm not bringing his body back. One once he lost power and Idi Amin wrote, um, gained his power, one of the first things he did for the Baganda people was actually bring back um, Mutesa's body. And so when I think of Idi Amin, I don't really see necessarily the war tyrant where I'm not disputing how somebody could see that. I'm looking at it a little bit more layered. He didn't want anybody in Uganda that wasn't Ugandan. He's been like a vanguard, right? So on trying fascist. to direct or push uh, Uganda forward in a certain Milosevic. direction. I have a completely different view. I know you do. <laughs> he, I like, know. He's like, like Hitler. It's it's very hard for me. I, to I know. That's 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 why this <laughs> is so oh, crazy. Oh, I feel like fight. a lot of his support probably obviously came from the Baganda people. Yes. Maybe the other groups were not so and down that, for exactly. it. Exactly. Is that kind of how it kind of unfolded a little that's bit? That's how I'm mm. looking at it. Well, yeah, when it comes to Ugandan politics, it's very complicated. I mean, like, one guy lasted 10 days it was like yeah we're not gonna open up the box of worms right now have fun in the comments <laughs> <laughs> switching it up a bit and speaking of fun one thing ugandans like to do is play sports and with that here's art for the sports part 
Technology has come a far way. The thing is about this technology is that it's Steve Jobs. <laughs> Man can try, okay? So, like usual, let's start with the traditional stuff. Uganda has quite a few customary games and sports that have been practiced for centuries during the Buganda Kingdom time. The most notable sports probably being Ekigo Ekiganda, or traditional Ugandan wrestling, Kwapena, which is like a double-sided dodgeball game, and Dulu, or Ugandan-style finger pull. Otherwise, in a more organized federation sense, Uganda has participated participated in every Summer Olympics since 1956, except the 1976 Montreal Olympics where they were protesting. Not gonna get into that. Anyway, since then they've racked up 11 medals, including four golds, all in running events. John Akibua won the first gold in 1972 Munich Olympics, and this lady, Peruth Shamutai, won the first gold in women's event. Apart from that, all the other medals are in boxing. Yes, Uganda is kind of a boxing enthusiast country. One Ugandan uppercut, and you're Ganda. <laughs> Otherwise, of course, many Ugandans will claim that soccer or football Amin was is their favorite boxer. sport. We say that in every episode, yeah, was. right? Why, why That's soccer, they, right? Why would they call oh, that football? You're kicking with your foot into a net. I don't get it. Yeah, the rest of the world that's definitely wrong. soccer. Yeah, because you sock the ball. You sock it. You <laughs> sock it with your foot because you're wearing a sock. Wearing a... Okay. Actually, the origin of the name soccer is much more stupid. <laughs> if I can say it like that. Uh, basically, back in the day, the British, yes, the British are the ones who made the name soccer. But uh, back, whoever like was a part of a certain sport or field, they would always add like the uh, suffix er at the end. So somebody would be a jocker, somebody would be a pooler, somebody would be uh, a soccer. Where did they get the SOC then? Okay. Uh, basically, back in the day, uh, originally, the name of the sport was known as Association Football. And notice in Association, there's SOC, Association, SOC. And from that, because somebody, you know, was part of football, he was part of Association Football, or he was a soccer. Call it football. Let's, let's, um... Let's destroy the name soccer. Let everybody from now on say football and let uh, let's burn any copy of any book that has the word soccer. And no, I'm just kidding, but I'm not advocating for like incomplete. So well, maybe, but let's just all call it football. Come on. High five. Yeah. We figured it out. American logic, buddy. Unfortunately, they have never qualified for the World Cup. However, they did finish second in the Africa Cup of Nations in 1978. All right, so that's about it for the sports part. I'm out of here. And remember, guys, when in doubt, flex it out. Unless you're weak and useless. Okay, see ya. Thank you, Art. My grandmother was actually one of the first women to play uh, football really? in Uganda. So you come from Buganda royalty and you come from athletic royalty. Damn. Let's get it, well, man. Where, where the, what is this guy I brought Let, on the show, Let's man. get it, man. <laughs> let's get it. Well, speaking of heritage, let's bring it over to Hannah to cover some interesting facts in the culture segment, shall we? Go, Hannah, go. Geographies, what's up? I'm back. And remember to get a random Hannah shirt at geographynow.com. And speaking of clothing articles, Uganda has a myriad of traditional costumes, both used at events and sometimes even worn daily on the streets. The most common one you will find on women will probably be the Gomesi dress, characterized by its high square shoulder pads, long hem, and kitambala sash tied around the waist. The most common men's attire at social events is usually the kanzu, a long white tunic similar to the Arab thobe, usually accompanied by a dress jacket. British actor of Ugandan descent Daniel Kaluuya even wore one to the premiere of Black Panther and Ugandans loved it. Guess what? Uganda also has the bride prize tradition. Depending on what region and tribe you are part of when getting married, the groom and his family usually have to pay a large fee to the bride's family for sending her off. In the cities, this is usually gifts or money. In the rural areas, it's usually livestock. In 2015, Uganda's Supreme Court actually made it illegal for a husband to demand a bride price refund in the case of a divorce. Ooh. Can't get your money back! Arts and media! Woohoo! Believe it or not, Uganda has a fast-growing cinematic industry and many people attribute it to Wakaliwood films. There it is. Many documentaries man, have been made the man on is this killing topic. Us, man. And in 2005, Isaac Goffrey Jeffrey, Nambwana, aka the Quentin Tarantino of Uganda, started his own like low-budget action movies. <laughs> 
filmed around the Wakaliga slum of Kampala. He did all the directing and editing himself. Clips of his movies went <laughs> viral online and suddenly the whole, the whole world thing. fell in love with features like Who Killed Captain Alex and Bad Black. They were even featured in the Seattle International Film Festival. Well, and when that guy was shooting his AK from a helicopter. One guy just wanted to have hilarious. fun and suddenly it became an industry. Well, another industry in Uganda would be the music industry and normally I'm really bummed about this segment but right now I'm so pumped because... Keith's not here, so I brought my other half to do the segment. That puts me in an awkward position, but the music in Uganda oh, has geez. an interesting backstory. Every tribe and ethnic group has their own distinct style of vocals, dances, and instruments. But the most popular traditional style would probably be the fast-paced baksimba, which uses fast percussion made up of gourd rattles, cow horn trumpets, and various stretched animal skin drums. This is usually accompanied by the muwagola dance, performed by women, which feature feather belts tied around the waist to accentuate the rapid hip shaking. Bakasimba has made its way I'm into modernity lying. and has been incorporated in contemporary Ugandan music. The most well-known genre probably being the Kadongo Kamu, created by the Baganda people in the 1960s. Some say Fred Masagasi being the father of that genre. The guitar was used as sort of a substitution to imitate the bass drum used in Bakasimba and the rest is history. In fact, there's a word in the Lugandan language, Nyege Nyege, which means an irresistible urge to dance. And so, Uganda made the Nyege Nyege International Music Festival. The events include performances mostly focusing on Eastern African artists, but also include some from outside Africa. Otherwise, contemporary Ugandan artists today have worked their way up into the mainstream African music scene. Kimmy has an interesting story on how she got a number one hit in Uganda, so I'm out. Back to Kimmy. She's awesome. See ya. Later. Thank you. By the way, you guys are both musicians. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, oh. yes. So, fun fact, I actually had a radio number one hit Maybe in I should Uganda be in 2012, inspired by Navio, who was a huge Ugandan artist. One of the people quite the who rapper. put me on was Lillian of Believe the very <laughs> big pop group Blue 3. And Pion's also an artist as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, that's actually how we met. Mm. So, you can go to PS Rebels Everything. You could check out our music. You and your brother, right? Yeah, me and my brother. We're working cool. on new beauty videos now. And I'm always open to, like, collaborating. Support the artist. So collaborating oh, with new artists, man. Gotta plug the co the guest host, man, as much as possible. <laughs> plug, plug, right. plug. Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> well, we've covered so much. The only thing left to talk about are the friends of Uganda. This is gonna be an interesting one. Let's jump into it. All right, so Uganda knows how to interact with their friends and neighbors. Why don't we go a little bit more into depth about it on the next uh, motion graphic coming up? Let's Keep do that. It. First of all, outside of Africa, Uganda has had ties to the UK after independence, and many of the Indo-Ugandans were granted permission to move to the UK during the expulsion years under Idi Amin. Today, they have had multiple aid projects and high-level diplomatic visits that have taken place between the two countries. During Idi Amin's rule, Libya actually became a close friend, and Gaddafi invested a lot in the country and supported them in liberation wars. They even built a mosque named after Gaddafi. Today, though, less attention has been focused on between the two since Libya has had to deal with more of their own internal affairs due to current events. If we're going to talk about their best friends, however, we have to bring it back to East Africa. For one, South Sudan and the DRC are, as mentioned in the episode, the largest refugee nations that arrived to Uganda. The three countries have had lots of interaction between them and their ethnic groups, dating back centuries even before current borders were established. Rwanda is kind of seen as like the stable, strict, clean, organized neighbor for friend that acts nice to them, but is kind of low-key competing with them in almost every field. Both of them kind of secretly want to see who can out economic like growth spurt the <laughs> other, but they still love each other and get along well. It's like the best competing friendship in East Africa. Meanwhile, Burundi is watching in the corner, taking notes, hoping they can do the same eventually. When it comes to their closest friends, however, more or less, most Ugandans that I talk to have said that it's either Tanzania or Kenya or both. Generally speaking, these three countries are the trifecta powerhouses that keep East Africa afloat. Nearly everything trade-wise finance-wise, education-wise, and even culture-wise goes through these three countries when it comes to East African affairs. They all pretty much started the whole Kiswahili revolution that initiated the first indigenous lingua franca to be used on the African continent and being an official language of the AU. They share the same history of being former British colonies and hence they also speak English. They also share the same foods, the same dance moves. They often intermarry and have families. And overall, these three get each other the best out of all other countries. In conclusion, you two are the Ugandans. I gotta give this to you. I'm out. Uganda, you are awesome. Entrepreneurial, as we've learned, a drive to keep pushing 
despite the limits that have been placed on us. You know, Uganda just continue having the spirit and, and protecting the essence of what it means to be a, a Ugandan. So that's why I think it's very, very important for Ugandans to continue controlling our direction and controlling what we want to do. And as you see, y'all have just rocked with us this whole time. We just barely touched the surface, but it's a very rich and diverse history. And let's keep it that way. One love. Cool. Stay this tuned. was cool. We held it down. Yeah, you guys held it absolutely. down. That was really great. All right, guys. So uh, stay tuned. Ukraine is coming up next. Ooh. <laughs> That's, oh my God. Ukraine, you made it <laughs> to geography now. Like the country is still there. That's going to be quite the episode. But before we get to Ukraine, there's going to be flag slash fan day. I like it when it was Flag Slash Fan Friday. It was very uh, literal, but what can you do? Hey everybody, welcome back to Flag Slash Fan Day. Hope you liked the Uganda episode. It was nice. Geography Now merch like this mug at geographynow.com. Not selling out if it's your brand. All right, I know these videos don't get as many views as the others, but don't mind making them because it's all about following that format. Anywho, some things we forgot to mention in the Uganda episode. Did you know that C-sections were performed here in antiquity? In the 1870s, a medical missionary by the name of Robert William Falcom observed the Kahura tribe in what was at that time the Katara Empire performing c-sections on women they used herbal mixes to heal the wounds and they used alcohol as an anesthetic Let's see what else do we have here there was Bad actually alcohol. a scheme in 1903 theodore herzl who proposed settling east africa yes, in what is now uganda as a settlement for the jewish population creating a new jewish homeland but uh yeah plans were scrapped never happened but east africa was considered in any case lots of other fun facts we forgot if you want to write them in the comments please feel free to do so otherwise we got to move on so without further also uh, madagascar <laughs> Or the Jews, believe it or not. Even Argentina. Like some places were suggested. I had so much Jewish fun filming the Uganda band. episode with Kimmy and Paihan. It was great. I actually really liked uh I really wanted to put that uh, you know, that discourse that they had about the whole Idi Amin thing. I thought it was really important to put that in the episode. In any case, uh they're both musicians. Feel free to follow them if you want. PS the Rebels, Kimmy Katiti. Paihan actually sometimes puts Swahili lyrics in his music. That's your jam, go for it. But what else is our jam on these episodes? Uh the flag. So let's jump into the flag, shall we? The flag is a banner made up of six horizontal bands of three alternating colors, black, yellow, and red. In the center of the flag is a white disc emblem containing the national bird, the gray crowned crane, known for its gentle and graceful nature. The colors of the bands each have their own meaning. The black stands for the native people of Uganda, the yellow stands for the African sunshine that falls upon the land, and the red stands for the brotherhood of Africans, oftentimes saying that they are all connected by blood. So, uh, technically, it's not a blood of those who fight for the freedom, but it's a blood that connects brotherhood so yeah uganda blood brothers you get the point prior to this they were under the british using the british union jack we'll flag <laughs> with the emblem on it that also had the gray crown crane they pretty much used that up until they got independence so there you go and uh speaking of the gray crown crane let's talk about the coat of arms shouts we the coat of arms has a shield in the center and on the shield you can find blue waves representing the waters of lake victoria and albert also you can find the sun and which represents the curious. brilliant rays of the sun the country enjoys under it is a a traditional drum used for dancing and summoning people I thought that was meetings a sweet and events and ceremonies <laughs> but it is also a symbolic image that stands for the country's former royal families Skyrim. and monarchs from there the sides of the shield are flanked by the national animal the gray crowned crane and the ugandan cob both representing the abundant wildlife of the country the animals and shield are standing on a green mound with blue and white streaks representing the nile that starts and in the country and on each side of the yeah. river are one of the two main cash crops coffee and cotton finally at the bottom lies the national motto in English for God and my country. And since independence, this has pretty much been the only coat of arms they've ever had. And keep in mind, Uganda was actually the very first country to use the lenticular shaped shield or the traditional African shield in their heraldic coat of arms. Soon afterwards, other countries like Kenya followed. So yeah, Uganda likes to keep it traditional and Ugandan. Gotta love that. So there you go. That's the flag and coat of arms. Fun stuff. Now you know what that means. It's time for G. The end of the video. Okay, so... Like I said, once again, if anybody wants to check out my book, description below, or just go to my channel. And in the about section, you'll see I have put the link to my book. It's on, it's out right now on amazon.com. So you can get, if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can basically get it for free. Or it's only four bucks, so it's not that much. I wasn't, you know, 
out there trying to like put a huge price tag on it. I just really wanted to get leave something behind. Basically, this is why I always went to like write a book. There's a lot of knowledge based stuff in there if you like knowledge. So do check it out. Thank you all once again for watching and as always, take care.